Hello, hello, everybody, and welcome to another week ahead trade plan stream. I'm your boss, your old boss. Zoomed in a little too much there. All right. So, wow. This was a, at least on the dollar here, kind of a, a surprising strengthening move into the end of the week. After FOMC, I was certain, uh, at least a lot more certain, that we'd end up closing down here. And it seems like the consensus is the only thing that really makes a whole lot of sense for the dollar strength, at least at first glance, is these PMIs that came out. So quite a lot of people uh, are confused. I, I kind of expressed this, confer this uh, concern in the last stream with this dollar strength. I am sort of pessimistically risk on. So while next week I would like to still be risk on, I'm not really 100% sold on it. And you can see how the odds update between this daily and 12 hour time frame. Yeah, you know what? You want to know why that happens? That's because this 12 hour time frame is only getting 17 years of data. And then you go to a daily time frame here, and it's getting 34 years of data. It's double. That's why it's important you get as much chart history as possible when you're loading these indicators. So then you have as accurate as possible statistics. Man, oh man, I'm also kind of doing the stream a little uh, late. Uh, <laughs> I've been very, very busy uh, today. And now I've found some updates to program and I'm working on new features for my indicators and I, uh, I'm running more tests to figure out like what's the most optimal way to implement those updates. So I really got my work cut out for me and I'm extraordinarily motivated to get some some updates, some like big features out for these indicators. I'm really, really, really looking forward to getting some stuff out and, and trying some stuff over the next week. Very, very, very excited about what's to come going forward. Yeah, so let's Hop into setting expectations for the next week. And let's start off with the dollar here and set our nominal expectations, which is just based off what is most likely for a given week. And I think it's fair for me to actually look at some of these monthly odds. So we will we will definitely do that. Because Next week is also the last, effectively, the last trading week of the month. So we not only want to look at how next week is likely nominally to close, we also want to double check it against the monthly closing odds to see if they line up and if there's any discrepancy. So then if there is a discrepancy, we're just aware. So let's go ahead and do that. Uh, let's start off with the week and then we'll go to the month on some of these assets. So it might be a slightly longer stream. Um, okay, let's just do it. I got my water, I got all this stuff ready, just making sure because I know it's probably going to be at least, this stream's at least going to be uh, an hour. Okay, but I'm also up against the clock because I got people who want to go out and do things tonight and da 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 da. So let's go ahead and move on. So first, we have this line right here. I'm gonna hide the indicators real quick. We have this line as the expectation we drew from the very last trading day of February. So this is labeled twenty four oh two twenty nine. So this is the closing expectation we set towards the 
end of the month. So we can see this expectation was wrong. I'd say this expectation was wrong because this is trying to figure out where the low is. We actually came in down here. We didn't get that follow through. Dollar just got strong, 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 except on this day, which was FOMC. So until I get some more information, I'm not going to try and justify the move over the last two trading days. Let's just look at our nominal odds here. So for next week, somewhere around here probably would be the close. Let's go ahead and set that to blue. And today is the 22nd of March, 2024. Ah, so for any given week without using seasonal data, the close is somewhere up here most of the time. And if we look at our seasonal data, you can see you don't usually close up here most of the time. In fact, it's like 22, 23% of the time the close for next week seasonally relative to pivot points over the last 34 years is somewhere between this R0.5 and R1.5 pivot. So this is why I, I'm pessimistically optimistic because I would say uh, a lot of the charts we'll probably end up looking at today are probably going to follow this sort of pattern here. So more risk off going into the beginning of the week. And then drifting lower into a close. Now let's go ahead and look at our high odds. And there you go. Most of the time, the top next week comes in somewhere around here. So I'm expecting some continuation over these trading days into a high up here uh, just at or in the top 104 handle maybe it reaches 105 but i'm expecting the higher 104s to get hit now what i want to do here is also look at the high odds yeah and you can see right there there's a peak so i'll go ahead and track that and then you can see nominally for any given week the closes are around here but again, seasonally, and we'll use the shorter period here of 17 years. You can see a lot of closes in the last 17 years are down here. If you expand that out to the last 34 uh, years, it's somewhere around here still. So now's the time when using seasonal data to ask the question, do we have should we follow the seasonal expectation of this data because it's deviating a lot from how a typical week non-seasonally? So this is the distribution of returns generally for any given week. So you can see there's a positive skew to this distribution. So a lot of closes like to close green for a week. But next week seasonally, it's most of the time pretty bad like more than 50% of the time, it's, it's pretty bearish. I'm willing to kind of go with this view right here for now as my nominal view and to go with the uh, probability pivots. And the reason being is that even still, if we get the high next week around here nominally, this would just be an undershoot, right? If we have a move that goes instead of all the way down here to here, I, I just would consider this to be an undershoot of this expectation here. So while we could set this expectation to go essentially 1% lower on the index, a full one, Point 0.1 points lower. If we get this 
view here, it would just be, yeah, it went in the same direction, but it effectively went sideways after hitting the hub. So net net, that's fine. But I am interested in actually checking if there's any more. Yeah. So right around here, I would see the risk of going up here. So that would be the primary risk I would be checking out. And then I'll timestamp that. Of even more upside. So if we were to go up here, then I would expect a more consensus pull back to kind of this area. So this would be my nominal expectation. And this would be the uh, quite risk on expectation. And you can actually see that sort of thing working over here. It's like, hey, we reached this high once we cracked this level, even though it wasn't at the time I expected. Uh, I was thinking, oh, uh, we're right here. If FOMC comes out hawkish and they're only expecting 50 basis points for 2024, crossing above here and reaching this spot should be no problem. Um, again, the PMIs came out positive. It, that's really the, the main thing people are looking at for maybe why this dollar strength came in. But it'll be interesting to read outlooks as to why exactly this happened. Maybe there's some sort of major economic event that's getting front run. Um, but it's not entirely too obvious to me at this moment so i'm not going to be uh you know drawing up expectations without doing some more research and i got about uh, 150 emails to still go through i've been posting outlooks in the discord today and i haven't found really a satisfactory explanation for this dollar strength into the end of the day so hopefully maybe i'll get some answer over the weekend I'm really going to be searching for commentary on this particular move and why that occurred. So I can try and set some better expectations going into next week and maybe update these views here. But as far as this goes, I think that's quite a, a fair assessment of the expectations for next week. Some upside continuation into a likely high seasonally or right up here or up here for next week or using the seasonally use data here right somewhere up here now seasonally there's no highs up here maybe on the daily chart when we load more historical data there is yeah you can see this is why having more historical data can be useful but still the nominal expectation would be up and then down for the following week around here, in my opinion. And as I just in case, let's check out the low odds. Ooh, those low odds are quite low. So it might end up looking like this, to be frank. And then you pop up into end of week like that. That would be quite a strong move. I'm I'm not too sure if that's actually going to happen. It wouldn't be the first time I've set expectations for particularly volatile moves and ending up, you know, nailing them. And this is why we set nominal expectations. Let's also look at our low odds here. Set this for one week. Yeah, there is something down there. And by something, it only shows up here on the daily chart when you use a lot of historical data. It might not be too obvious to the naked eye because these are different shades of gray and green here. But what I'm looking at here on this daily chart is this spot right here. This spot. So why am I looking at that spot? Well, on this 
12 hour chart you can see there's really nothing there you have your peaks here at these green spots and then your odds tail off tail off tail off they just continue tailing off there's a little bit of a bump there but it's like 0.3 percent increase right it goes from like 1.47 percent of finding the low right here to 1.9 percent so it increases slightly here when you use the last 17 years of historical data but when you use all of the charts data as 35 historical data now that percentage becomes a bit more significant it goes from like neg uh, from like 1.8 percent here like 3.1 percent bumps up uh, a bit more here so there is reason to say hey during particularly bearish weeks right around here finding a low can make sense and then when we look at our seasonal data you can see this is actually also right at the spot where the probability weighted pivot is plotted and this probability weighted pivot line this orange dotted thing is a weighted pivot so it takes these percentages and uses them as weights against all the different pivot point levels and it compresses all the information into a weighted mean and it gives you this value here and it also says like hey going down here is also really sketch it's just i look at this and it makes me want to go and read more outlooks and read more research to figure out what the potential risks could be for the dollar next week uh, something i'd be looking for in this research would be something along the lines of any economic information out of the rest of the G7 that looks good. So I'm actually not necessarily looking at what's going on in the US for more dollar strength. I just want to see nominal views come out for the United States. I want it to just to keep getting economic data coming out at consensus. And I want to see growth. Uh, some sort of acceleration of growth or improving economic conditions in the rest of the G7 in order to actually get this expectation to follow through. So I'm going to be looking around at what economic events I should be aware of and how those events would need to print in order for this expectation to actually realize. Otherwise, I'm kind of equally waiting uh, going up to here and closing right around here closer to the 105 price this week so quite a bit of due diligence that has to get done quite a bit of research that has to get done so that would be for the dollar now i did say it'd be worth our time for this week ahead trade plan to look at how the month is likely to close so let's go ahead and bring up the monthly odds here yeah and you can see a lot of closes this month are in this area right here so if we extrapolate that forward that's this whole area up here so i'm looking at this for the month i'm still not too fond of expecting a close down here next week there's still some odds of it occurring but it's not the nominal expectation it's not where most of the probabilities lie if we use the ranges and check that out for the month it also gives you exactly the same spot right this area here we highlighted with the seasonal data from the pivots and this area is highlighted still with the data from just any given month, non-seasonal. So while this would be the nominal expectation I set for next week, I am not totally sold on that quite yet. I need to read more research. I need to read more outlooks to feel good about 
actually following through on this expectation. For all I know, we could be hitting this high here. We could top out there next week and then just slightly drift lower, right? In this scenario here where you don't reach this spot here, you reach some close that's in between these two areas. And that right now seems more likely to me. Oh, there we go. That the close next week is somewhere here. That seems more reasonable to me. So I hope that makes sense. And this is really where using the monthly closing data can come in handy when planning the last week of the month. This is where the monthly closing odds can be quite helpful in figuring out just how the month is going to line up. Okay. So now I can pretty much pull up any other asset that I want. Um, I'll go and cover the G7 US dollar pairs. So let's go ahead and do that. For these, we'll still get 21 years of data on the daily or the weekly chart time frame. So we'll go with that for now. Real quick. Let's look at our low odds here. Euro dollar had a particularly interesting low odd here seasonally. You can see 57% of the time over the last 21 years, the low next week is in this, uh, what, 25 pip spot? Uh, it's like, no, it's uh, 47, 48 pips, right? And I think that odd is large enough just to flat out say yeah bearish continuation looks likely in that scenario and let's go ahead and look at our low odds here and you can also see right there hey there's a peak so i'd be cautious cast here um, but i don't even know if i should set that sort of expectation Yeah, I would just go with this flat out. Now let's look at our high odds. And a lot of highs are like way up here, way up here. Let's go ahead and check our ranges. See if there's anything up there. Yeah, something like this. So. Yeah, maybe it catches that R1. Essentially, the volatility from last week has expanded the set of pivots. So this seems more like a range-bound week, if anything. Uh, bullish range bias would probably be what I would pull up here. Yeah, a large probability of overshoot there. But then when you look at it on the ranges, it's like, well, yeah, you seasonally relative pivots can overshoot this thing a lot. But when you take into account the ranges, this is, you know, yeah, it's roughly, what, 60-ish percent of, no, more like 40-ish percent of highs are way up here. So it can go up here. It's just once you start going in this area here next week, it becomes hard to figure out where exactly the top is going to be. You could probably look back into history and say like, oh, there's a high here. There's a high here. We could target those this week here. Maybe take shots there. It's just, well, I don't know. What if the thing goes even higher? Like up to here and goes past this high and it targets this high. That's kind of the thing when you look back into the chart's history and you start drawing lines horizontal, and trying to project those into the future as support and resistance. You don't, how do you weigh this high versus this high versus this high? 
the higher you go, the less, the more volatility you need. And the more volatility you need, the less likely it is to reach these spots unless you have some particularly good wins. So I'm all right with just setting these more nominal range bound expectations. Uh, essentially, this is like saying, hey, I'm expecting a lower high next week. Uh, let's go ahead and check out the closing odds. So using the ranges, it says maybe somewhere around here, pull back after the high. Go ahead and set this to blue. Let's go ahead and pull up the seasonality. Check that out. Where do most of the closes occur seasonally? Yeah, that's essentially in line somewhere around here most of the time, but some chances of going down there. So we can kind of split hairs here and say uh, closing down to around central pivot. Yeah. That would be the nominal expectation that I'd set here. Uh, one reason I'm particularly liking to be risk on, but again, pessimistically, because I want to know what's made the dollar so strong into the end of the week, is if we do something like this, right? And I put, let's say, the stop right here, S1.5, which actually for that standard, for that range bias, this range bullish bias, this is actually the stop loss for that sort of trade entry. It looks something along these lines. And you'd want to probably hop out at these highs. Yep, something along those lines. Isn't it so cool we can kind of do these things into the future? Having the next periods stuff is just so cool. Good trade point. Uh, let's actually check things out now for the month. Wow, a lot of closes up here. So yeah, maybe down and then up. Maybe it doesn't even go as far up as you want. So I think outside of this general view of bearish continuation, risk off continuation into, at least on these US dollar pairs, into next week to find a low and then rally. I'm concerned particularly on how high these things are actually going to go. Because it, to me, seems like going into the end of the month, uh, maybe the volatility will decrease a bit going into the close here. We can also pull up the monthly closes here for the pivots. And yeah, it says like, hey, right around here, you're likely to find some of your closes. Uh, if you're seeing more downside, this area is a risk. So sub 108 and closing essentially sub uh, 107.5 uh, has been on the table here in the last 21 years. But my nominal expectation would be to have some relief, so a dip below 108, rally back above 108, and then close the week above 108. As far as high targets, this thing could easily get missed. Yeah, sure, it's likely to have some move higher, but this would be a big jump in volatility because you can see these bars here kind of nice and consistent and then right around here the volatility starts going up volatility starts going up the more bars you see that are bigger one after the other is going to bring up that volatility so if we continue to see increases in volatility that would give me hope of reaching these areas here towards the higher end of the 108 handle and yeah that would be that and next month also looks fairly bullish to me. Okay, let's go ahead and check out the Aussie. Pretty flat looking odds here. 
uh, not perfectly flat. Seems like this area is kind of the working zone of where most closes are, but you can see that's quite a big range there. From here to here, that's about 130 pip range for where the close usually ends up. So not too much information here on the closing date. Let's go ahead and look at the low odds first. Okay. So something around finding the low around here, or maybe even falling a bit lower into the kind of closer to the middle of the 64 handle, looks like. That's reasonable. Yeah, so here or here. Right, one of these two peaks. I'm not exactly sure which peak to target because it's really going to depend a, a lot on the economic data here for next week. I've read some outlooks. I haven't read the week ahead outlook from uh, Westpac yet, so I uh, don't have a total view or understanding of exactly what the expectations are yet for next week. But I'm going to be on Saturday doing an Outlook review for everyone who's reading the Outlooks alongside with me and participating in that habit. And that should be at 2 p.m. Uh, tomorrow on Saturday. So around lunch, spend an hour or two going through some Outlooks and talking with other people and discussing those Outlooks, maybe some of the nuances of those expectations. And that'll be for guys who are in the trading group. It definitely, it's been worthwhile the last few times I've been there. And I'm always there. I try to, I've been late a couple of times. I, I'm a busy guy. Go ahead, give me a break there. <laughs> All right. So I'll just go ahead and say my nominal expectation with the information I have will be this on the low side for. Aussie dollar, but I'm going to be open to setting my expectation lower by like another uh, 30 to 50 pips, depending on how those outlooks come out. So that would be my expectation going into the opening of next week. Now let's go ahead and update, look at our high odds here for Aussie. Did do a pretty good job last week of our expectations, huh? This area here, uh, I actually was taking this short, and I saw the yield spreads increase. I covered this on uh, the FOMC stream that I did on Wednesday. I saw the yield spreads were increasing going into FOMC, so I got out of this short. I wish I flipped the bank, because <laughs> we did set this expectation way up here. Right. And I was like, this thing ain't going to go all the way up there. And that this these first two, where the low comes in and where the high came in, those were two good expectations. But as far as I know, this move here still on the dollar into end of week was quite a surprise. So while this direction was correct, the magnitude of this was not. And that was just a surprise. Oh, wow. A lot of lot of highs up there a lot of highs up there swap that in check out our high odds wow and that's right at a peak in the distribution there so i think i'll kind of leave that as is yeah i'll just leave that as is now let's go ahead and look at our closing odds And it does make sense for some negative drift into the close. Yeah. Something along these lines. Essentially back to central pivot. Okay. That would be my expectation. Uh, real quick, I am in, kind of interested in figuring out the, the stop loss. This might not be that great of a stop <laughs> but it does make sense to do something like add down here later right 
do, and I'll pull up Y. I just gotta get the low odds set up. Yeah, so like way down here would probably be the stop on the pips. So taking a bite right here, and then another bite right here. That makes sense to me. It's just this ends up becoming a one to one risk to reward. And the quote unquote real trade is down here. But because of the risks of just more volatility on Aussie, giving a bit more uncertainty on the odds that we're looking at, uh, this sort of layout does make more sense to me. However, if it does come down this low, uh, I would not expect this sort of expectation. Yeah, so this one can be quite, quite, quite dicey. Maybe a stop like this would make sense, but considering the increase in volatility recently, getting stopped out on this can... You can just have some random noise take you out on a stop that's this size. Like most candles recently have moved enough to, can move enough to take out that close of a stop. And we're talking, that's like a 16 pip stop. So that makes sense. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that would be quite a tough one. Definitely not the most attractive of the trades we've checked out so far. So let's go ahead and check out New Zealand. Kind of a similar situation. Probably right around here. Put the trade set up. All right. Go ahead and... Set this to red for the bearish expectation. See, this is kind of what I'd be expecting under weaker than expected G6 economic data. So if the United States is outperforming the rest of the world still, the rest of the world isn't recovering more with the data we get next week, then I'd expect something that looks a bit like this. At least with New Zealand, I can point out that their GDP came out pretty harsh. It really wasn't a great GDP that they had this week. So New Zealand was kind of the dog of the G7 in FX. So this expectation not getting met makes sense to me. And this is kind of the risk I'm pointing out back over here on this euro dollar of like hey unless things really turn out well for european data against us data this thing could easily get missed so real quick let me just double check that yeah so somewhere around here makes sense Let's go ahead and check out our high odds now. So we got that spot here and that spot there. Yeah, yeah. Pretty flat looking odds here. So seasonally where the high comes in is pretty random. There's a bit of a bias kind of towards this area right here. You can see 19 and 23 is greater than 14, 14, 14. So there is a bit of a bias in that particular spot for finding the high. Uh, if we bring up this, that spot looks like a good way to slice the information we got. So let's go ahead and do something along these lines. Okay, let's go ahead and look at our closing odds now. So without any seasonal adjustments, 
uh, using all the weekly data that we have available. Let's go ahead and put that as the nominal expectation with this. Let's look at our seasonal data, see where the closes are for the week. And yeah, sort of the same spot, so don't need to update that expectation. And yeah, that makes sense. So something like that. This does look better than Aussie, but the volatility here in the autocorrelation has been quite strong. So uh, that stop is only 25-ish pips. That might be enough room, but maybe that stop needs to be maybe that stop needs to be increased to like here, in my view. Yeah, quite a lot of odds here. That's kind of yeah. I'd say that's that's a pretty good way to split hairs. What I'm reading when I'm looking at this is you get a lot of lows here and a lot of lows here. So these are kind of like your two peaks. And then past here, all of these odds in this area here are effectively uniform. They're very, very close to each other. You can see this is 2.9 to 3.8. So they're all in this area here, kind of within about a percent of each other. So there's some decent probability of finding the low here. It's just because all of these odds are so similar, it can effectively be a guess if your low comes in the top spot here or the low spot here, given the information that's on the chart, at least with this indication of just looking at the distribution. Okay, let's move on, check out the pound. Let's go ahead and Look at the low odds here. Yeah, so it's uh, essentially pick your poison. Low off the start of the week effectively or low down here. And considering how we're setting uh, more bearish expectations on a lot of these other USD pairs, I'd be set a bit of a lower expectation on the pound. Yeah, and you can see there's still some risk around here. So I, I don't even know if I'd like to trade this one. The shot would probably be something like that. All right, let's look at our high odds. Wow, uh, a lot of highs are here for like, way way up here it's like what is that seasonally over the last 21 years next week has some really really uh, high closing odds up here this is what 38 percent of the time the close the high the high for next week is like at least from the open 200 to 300 pips up here I, I don't I don't think we'll be getting up here unless there's some some massive bit of information that comes out next week. Um I don't even know what would send us up. This looks a bit more convincing for a more nominal view. Again, uh relative to pivots. Next week would be considered range-bound for a lot of these assets, I think. And range-bound as defined, at least when using pivots and price relative to pivots, it's anything between S1 and R1. And you can see this area right here is just below R1. So I want to check out the highs, and yeah, we got a peak right there. So I would like pound to join the pessimistic risk on rally it would essentially still be a lower high from a lot of these assets that are in this downtrend so it'd be nice to get that but then it might even make sense to get short 
uh, a lot of these pairs into the end of the week. Let's go ahead and look at our closing odds. Yeah, you can see a decent number of closes up there, but nominally where most of the closes are, it's something like that. A bit of a pullback into end of the week. A lot of these trades look very, very similar. Oh, huh, well, this is interesting. A lot more of the closes just for a given week are like right there. But then you have this spot here. Either it's pointing down to here or pointing down to here. Let's go ahead and split hairs real quick. And yeah, that, that looks fine to me. When you have large discrepancies between the seasonal data and the non-seasonal data, so this is the non-seasonal data. This is just the distribution of what the returns look like for any given week. And this is what the data looks like when you turn it into seasonal data and look at it on pivots. So I'm just splitting the hairs between both years. So that would be the best I can do, at least for the closing expectation. So I have a bit more uncertainty about this closing expectation into the end of week, but I, I like this expectation more going into like just here to here and keeping it simple as okay anything else oh the dollar cad yeah this thing's been nutty it really did well on fomc it did a hundred pips on fomc and then it reversed the entire thing. <laughs> next week though uh there's a particularly interesting statistic on so all that is a bunch of zeros. So 100% or CAD have been below here. So somewhere up like that. And this exchange uh, rate pair is flipped. Oh, hold on, did my internet go out or something? Successfully reconnected, delay. All right, we're still good. But now we're an hour into the stream. And now you can see why I'm saying this is going to be a, a stream on the longer end. I, and I even skipped looking at some of those monthly uh, odds on some of those other pairs. Sorry about that. But I'm kind of still crunched for time. I got about another 30 minutes. So I'd like to cover all the major pairs at least the week ahead expectations as best as I can. And then, you know, as we get into next week, anything that I didn't have the time to cover now, I'll be covering in the first stream on Monday next week. So don't worry. And I'll have more information from reading some outlooks for the commentary here on the stream. So it'll be an interesting Monday as well. Uh, real quick, so while that'd be my high expectation seasonally, yeah, it's kind of split between up here and right there, so I'll just leave it there, split some hairs here. Now let's look at the closing odds real quick, because, yeah, so generally speaking, it wants to go up here. There's some closes here, so I think for next week, we just try and split the difference essentially down here to central pivot. And if I'm not mistaken, if I hide these indicators real quick, that would be a higher high and a higher low into next week. Kind of still establishing that the trend for dollar is actually still bullish net net across a lot of these pairs. So. Again, while I would like to be more risk on, because, you know, don't get me wrong, a lot of the economic data has been pretty neutral. There haven't been too many bearish surprises. The future expectation for inflation is, is really the key thing here. And 
all things being equal going forward, if we stay sticky or have a few upside surprises and we we don't kind of get the economic recovery clearly showing itself in the data over effectively the next month, that could create a lot more dollar positive drift. However, I gave some rants, I think last week or a week, two weeks ago, that was like, hey, while there's some people calling for a long dollar, it's important not to jump on the horse too quickly until the data actually prints. Because there can also be surprises to the downside. At least maybe not necessarily for CPI. I actually think CPI for next month is probably going to be higher than the prior one. The one that we just got this month. At least in the United States, that is. Um, not too sure about the rest of the world quite yet, but I'm going to be looking into that over the next week. Oh, hello, Ari. I see you. So, yeah, this would be my net expectation here going into the next week. I'm not too sure if I should really set a some low odds expectation here. I feel more comfortable with this expectation than last week on the dollar chart. And I already set my expectation here on the dollar, which is, you know, a bit more dramatic. But I think that there's a real chance that this thing still finds the low or closes uh, short of these expectations. So maybe still directionally the same way, but not necessarily the same magnitude. And then let's go ahead and check out dollar yen. Dollar yen is holding out here. Those are some good bullish continuation odds for next week. 33% of lows above the weekly central. Uh, my threshold is 25%. Uh, that's that's pretty good. But if the dollar does weaken at some point, I would not be surprised to see a move up. No. Yeah, so something along that line. Split some differences, all that red. I'm, I feel a bit more certain that the DOJ or the Ministry of Finance are going to be coming out over the weekend or sometime next week and saying, hey, we do not like this, and we're probably there's imminent intervention or something along those lines. So I'll go ahead and set this expectation now because this is just what I'm currently thinking. So something along those lines there. And let's look at our closes. Yeah, man, if you keep asking me to check out Guard, I'm going to ban you from the chat. <laughs> it's becoming like spam now, so stop. All right. Yeah, I'm going to split the hairs here and go like that for the closing expectation into end of week. Again, totally sold on this up and down movement for particularly, again, this thing could get a lot more bullish or a lot more bearish. And for transparency's sake, you can see my expectations. You know, sometimes they can get like radically wrong here on the end. I have not been setting good expectations here on the yen for the last month, just FYI. However, the, the yield spreads are getting more negative here, and the yield spreads have been doing a pretty good job of setting expectations for the yen. So if these negative yield spreads do continue to develop, I, yeah, I, I, lean, I lean bearish into the next week and into end of month. Um, yeah, with most likely sideways closing around 
151, maybe sub 150 a little bit. Uh, it's, it's really like whether or not you go like sub 150 next week is really going to be dependent on like the Ministry of Finance coming out and doing it. And FYI, they don't announce it when they do the intervention. They just do the intervention. And then they tell you at the end of the month if there was any intervention actions that happened during the entire month. So you only get a report at the end of the month. And at any point during the month, if they want to intervene, they can. And it comes down to sheer speculation as to whether or not they did intervene. But sometimes it can be quite clear. Like, people are usually fairly good at identifying, like, okay, this move was probably Ministry of Finance because they intervened in the bond market and they sold this asset or that asset. It's why it's really important when you're trying to get better at setting expectations for a particular asset going into some future time that you really do your best to try and listen to people who really know what they're doing, right? And this is me showing you the arrow saying, hey, you know, I'm definitely not, I have not been setting the best expectations here on Yen recently. Maybe sometimes in the future, I'm bang on with my expectations. But the most important thing is to actually know when I'm meeting my expectations and when things are either overshooting them, undershooting them, not meeting them at all, I I really feel like this sort of transparency is is important. And as I do more of these things, naturally it should be getting better. But you know, MUFG is good. Uh, Western Nakamura is my favorite to read and listen to. But yeah, I recently have been struggling with setting expectations on it man it's almost like i should have just been following my yield spreads or something i don't know <laughs> oh the yield spreads are red i'm just gonna be bearish until it changes oh the yield spreads are green i'm gonna be bullish until it changes but even that's not 100 percent straightforward because there are other causal factors that can move particularly an fx price than just the change in the yield spread and that's what these colors are showing, how this data is updating. So red in this area down here in the bottom of the chart creates red here, green down here creates green up here, and so on. So positive yield spreads make green, negative yield spreads make red. And the relationship isn't literally one to one. It's not absolutely causal. It's just a feature in a model and a thing to take into account. At least that's what I do. All right, I'm going to check out commodities now. That is one ugly, <laughs> that is one ugly looking distribution. Oh my God. Like, hey, you want to close all the way down here or all the way up here? Go, no. This is like a bipolar. When I when I see this sort of stuff, and I just I'm like, <laughs> it's like, hey, you want some volatility next week? <laughs> Let's go ahead and check out the high odds. Well, most of the time the highs come in around here, but they would probably be coming in from some low. So real quick, let's check that out. Yeah. I think down here is reasonable for a low. So I'll lower low on on Arlo. Uh yeah, while this end point was kinda close, I, I would just say my expectations from last week on Arlo were wrong. I said down, then up into a close up here, and instead it went up and then down. Uh, don't get me wrong, the close isn't that far away from here but 
in my mind, being like a dollar seventy five cents off from the flows, that's a bit too far of a margin of error for me to say I I feel good about that expectation being even close. So no, last week's expectations did not match what actually happened. And just as a little preview, yeah. Some good hits. It looks it, the expectations look pretty mixed as far as the hits here. They look pretty mixed. Uh, there's some stuff that I posted in the commodities channel about Sarah Week and uh, MU of G actually just released a podcast commentating over some of the messages that were in speeches that were given during Sarah Week. And if you're not familiar with what uh, Sarah Week is, it's like when you have all these major producers and players in the oil market, they get together and have a huge meeting in Texas and talk about their outlook and expectations and what they're currently working on in their business uh, for the energy industry. So there's some good things in there. Also, there's a Bloomberg article about uh, cocoa. Like this thing's still going up, up and away, and apparently this is this sees like no sign of stopping. It's a very interesting article. So if you're wondering why Coco is doing, you know, astronomical, uh, I I still haven't completely read that article to be transparent here, but I am. Uh, I did get through like the first couple of paragraphs, and I do plan on reading the rest of it. So real quick, yeah, that seems like. A good low expectation for the week. Let's go ahead and set our high expectation here. Yeah, yes, uh, I'll have to, I'll have to go with that. I'll have to go with that. And then maybe into the close. So. Oh, I have to actually update the color on that thing, green. Uh, yeah, are we, we can. Uh, just send me a message on Discord, that's all. Or whenever I'm in the voice chat. Um, probably uh, not tonight, so just send me a Discord, my man. Send me a message on the Discord. Let's see here. Da, da, da. Closing expectations. Oh yeah, that's right. This thing's all crazy. So yeah, I can split hairs and set them here, but this is, I don't even know exactly how I should be interpreting this and this. Like those are really far off seasonal expectations. I'm going to change the chart to something else. Wow. It, it's, it's on other exchanges. So this is the same chart. This is West Texas on Oanda, 21 years of data. And because it's a different exchange, you're going to get slightly different data points. You can see how it does look different. But net net, you have this move way down here, these moves way up here, and this one right in the middle. So next week is quite polarizing in my view. Like you get your close really high up really low down or sideways um yeah that that's going to be my but i'm just going to split the difference and call that as my expectation now let's go ahead and check out gold so while i did set this expectation and this expectation did line up well we've been setting good expectations on gold um that was Really nice to see. That was surprising to see. You know, the down move was surprising. Nice to see the upside on FOMC. And this this thing is like one or two points off from where I expected it to close. And from the low, it's again one or two points off from where I expected the low end. So while I did set the low in the closing expectation, you can see there's no green arrow here. So I didn't set a high expectation like over here, right? Uh, and this is why I didn't set a high expectation. <laughs> I, 
I actually was planning that this expectation was definitely going to be overshot. I, I was like, you know, this is what I would think if I just am looking at the odds nominally. But I would think I was absolutely expecting us to close much higher, like in this area up here on roll. And that I'd just be correct directionally on, yeah, we'll close the, the weak green. But for it to land right there, I'm like, yeah, that's this sort of reversal ain't looking so hot. And now next week's pivots are all sorts of expanded. You kind of have this whole area here now to deal with as far as closes go. Like most closes are in this area. So what's that? That's like close to 65, 70 points range for the closing odds. And essentially right that in the middle is where most closes occur. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this sort of expectation is like all sorts of boring. Uh, let's go ahead and look at our high odds here. Yeah, so let's go with lower than higher. Set that as green. Let's not forget to tie things uh, set up our low odds here Eesh. there's definitely some slide there so I'd be I'd be careful on more downside than expected uh, just like on New Zealand that I pointed out New Zealand dollar has kind of the uh, the same look, right? You can find your low around here. Most of the time you find your low around here. But these odds are not insignificant. And then when you look at the seasonal data, it's like, yeah, most of the time you find the low around here, but there's sliding potential. There's continuation potential. And these odds are not insignificant. So, I mean... In situations like this, it's like, it's, you got to reduce your risk. Like, I would be reducing my risk in spots like this. Because what if the thing slides higher? It becomes a lot harder to, to trade this. Like, if you put 1% of your account on this, and the thing slides lower and you can clearly see like, hey, there's a there's a pretty significant chance of the thing sliding lower. It doesn't make sense to size up on this. Like if I was gonna be trading oil next week on this, I do like ten basis points. Like, don't get me wrong, it'd be nice to to get two point five risk to reward. But guess what? On 10 basis points, the return on that is 25 basis points. You have five or six other trades that do 25 basis points, and then you could be up a percent on the week. And guess what? Just week after week. You know, and you're not going to make money every week. There are some guys out there who uh, are discretionary. Uh, Brian Watt. That's that's one cool guy. Oh my god, I'm so glad. Uh, his his cancer is now benign. If you know who that guy is, I'm very glad. I wish he would leave his streams up, but he takes them down after every time he goes live. Anyways, uh, yeah, th this would be a scenario where if I was trying to get exposure to this. I I'd be looking at that downside risk and saying nope. This is uh, if if I'm taking shots on this at these spots here at these nominal lows that I'm pointing out with the arrows and be like mm, I I gotta reduce this because there's still some there's there's still some odds there of finding the lower, but there's still good odds of going lower. So. Uh, Really wouldn't be my pick. Really wouldn't be my pick. So 
just that extra risk risk is not not too uh not too appetizing <laughs> all right now let's go ahead and check out crypto oh thank god crypto at least is is kind of still holding in there uh we got 13 years of data so we can use this sort of you can see how the odds are pretty flat this week you can kind of see how everything was all over the place most of the time next week if you're looking at things relative to pivot points and whatnot this is roughly where most of the closes most of the lows next week are so i wouldn't expect a lower low on crypto next week i actually expect crypto to effectively go sideways that's still my expectation on crypto and you can kind of see at least seasonally yeah that makes that makes sense and let's look at our closing odds yeah there's there's overlap when you look at the non-seasonal data so more or less sideways high and low at the range bound spots so uh, if i could draw some expectations probably something like this and back that up just a wee bit now i'm not going to timestamp these things because crypto is actually still open for uh i mean i might as well because even if i set these expectations i'll just and i know i'm not moving these when i set these expectations but for crypto i have to kind of make a slight exception because there's still time in this week another two days we have the weekend to go through and these drawings are only set in stone next week once this week actually closes out so when if uh, if bitcoin prices move up a little bit or down a little bit it'll shift these drawings so i'll have to shift the expectations to match that but i'll timestamp these things now just as like the original point in time when i drew these and then during maybe the stream on monday i'll go ahead and uh shift these around so then they kind of represent what my original intent was for the expectations going into next week uh litecoin looking pretty darn similar sideways ethereum uh, a little bit more of a bullish skew seasonally with only eight years of data also more or less sideways but yeah a bit more of a bullish skew on the distribution the next week and i should probably bring up nq and es so real quick yeah either closes up here or closes down there if i were to set the expectation of the close it would probably be somewhere up here i want to actually check out the low odds for next week here and see how low can we go how low can wow pretty darn low yeah uh pullback city for nq i think yeah right around here about a 250 point pullback yikes all right set that one to green and again there's sliding potential again here just like on gold and just like on a new zealand dollar sliding pullback and then probably up here or here probably taps a new high and then yeah probably just taps a new high and ends up closing a bit lower that would just be the nominal expectation yeah essentially just a bit lower for off the bat and let's go ahead and check out the s p it looks a bit more bullish actually than the nasdaq at least going into the close into the end of the week 
Oh, I want to do low odds first. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. A lot of good odds of finding your low right off the bat. I'm going to go with this area here between central pivot and S1 relative to the pivots. Yeah, I I kind of target the middle of that spot, the S0.5. So let's go ahead and do that. Set this to red. Go ahead and check out our high odds here. And yeah, that spot looks set up here. And also some skew on the upside. Seasonal. You can see 16, 16, 16. So past this R1 pivot, past uh, uh, 5350, I'd be concerned about not having a high degree of certainty of where the top's going to end up being for the big. So this would be, again, the nominal expectation. It's always nice to trade and your expectations are exceeded. I still consider those good wins. Okay, so what if my expectations weren't right? I was right in the right direction. And yeah, see, when you get your high up here, getting your close here doesn't make too, too much sense. So let's go ahead and split the difference. So maybe it closes in this area still, but I'm going to expect a bit more of a pullback into the close. And that's the best I can do, just with interpreting the indicators, looking at the nominal expectations, where things are most likely to go based off the stats that I have available to me with these indicators. But as I said at the beginning and throughout the stream, I think it's incredibly important to do additional research. Reading outlooks from institutions, uh, getting research from your bank, uh, getting pretty much as much information as you can to make yourself as apt as possible. You know, I'm trying to think about what other people are doing, why they're doing what they're doing. And you only figure that out when you go out of your way to go and be interested in what other people are doing. So if you spend the time to read some outlooks, you'll probably learn a lot about the different markets that are out there and why people hold the expectations that they have. And I mean, that's why I've been reading outlooks for years and years, week by week. It's made me definitely smarter and better at setting expectations. I set very good expectations actually on the dollar. This was a surprising move. So all throughout February, I was just, you know, totally bang on with these expectations here. March has been a bit more uh, difficult, but nothing like absolutely horrible. And now uh, watch me jinx it and just this thing goes all the way up to the moon or totally falls through 103. <laughs> hey, I'd like that falling through 103. Uh, maybe I can jinx that. <laughs> okay, you guys, I've pretty much covered everything that I uh, wanted to cover. So, yeah, that was the week ahead. Trade plans uh, with the false benchmark indicators. Uh, again, if you want to try these things out and uh, get access to the trading group, and then actually in the trading group again on Saturday, we have the Outlook review event where we go through all the outlooks that are in the Outlooks channel and uh, try and go over uh, anything else that gets released between now here on Friday and Saturday. Outlooks are essentially released from all these different institutions on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and even on Monday. 
So there's like a solid five day period, depending on what institution uh, you're looking at, that their Outlook gets released. And I just try to focus on reading Outlooks that come out Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. I don't bother with stuff on Sunday and Monday, because usually by the time we get to those days, I've read enough to have a good set of what the consensus expectations are, what some of the risks people are looking at going into the following week or into the next month. So yeah, good stuff. Anyways, I'll be back on Monday. I'll see you guys in the trading group on Saturday for the Outlook review event. And I'll see you guys in a bit.